Excellent. All right, welcome everybody. I'm just gonna give it another minute just to allow all of our participants to start coming in the room. Congratulations again on your acceptance to the MA in Climate and Society program. I think you're gonna really enjoy tonight's session. We have some phenomenal alumni and current students joining us. And I wanna make sure that we dedicate solid time for your Q and A's to gain perspective on their experiences in the learning community and certainly um, better understand what our alumni have been up to lately. I think we have some um, really diverse perspectives. Okay, excellent. And then just to confirm, we are um, recording this session. Um, so uh, if, for example, you need to, to leave a little sooner, um, we are going to be sharing the recording with all of our registrants um, later today or um, possibly tomorrow morning. So right from the start, my name is Alfred Ayub. I am the Director of Admissions here at Columbia Climate School. And congratulations, everyone, on your acceptance to the MA in Climate and Society program for the fall 2023 entry. Um, tonight's one hour is devoted to our alumni and current student panel. This is an opportunity again for you to gain further insight into the program from a current student and alums perspective. Um, and in terms of just some ground rules, um, this is being conducted in the Zoom webinar function. So we are asking that you um, keep your chat, or forgive me, your questions specifically to the Q&A function um, specifically in Zoom. So I, I went ahead and provided a screenshot. Um, and then in terms of the chat button, um, this is my, my shameless plug. If I, I love it when students share with us where they're joining us from. Um, so if you wouldn't mind sharing um, in the chat box uh, what city um, and or state or country perhaps that you're joining us from this evening, that's always really fun and exciting for us to just see how diverse um, you know, our admitted student population is. I will say we, we scheduled this session at 6 p.m. to allow certainly our alumni to be able to join after the working hours. We recognize that a lot of our students in, um, in East Asia and um, Africa might have some challenges with this time zone. So for those of you that are joining us from, from um, those time zones, we, we will sincerely say a huge thank you. So, Without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and um, uh, introduce our panelists. Um, so st starting off, I will um, begin with um, our alumni. Um, Elizabeth Wynn is joining us this evening. She is a graduate of the MA in Climate and Society program in our most recent graduating class of 2022. Um, followed up by um, Elizabeth is Brianna Carbajal, who is joining us as well from the MA in Climate and Society class of 2022. And then our two current students joining us is Abhinav Banthia um, in the MA in Climate and Society program this year, and Memo Harviar Martinez Curelche, um, who also is joining us this year. He's um, currently enrolled. Um, so just to go ahead and begin the session, and I think what I'm going to do for this is perhaps stop sharing um, my screen and allow all of our kind of, um, let's see here, if I can do this in a more sophisticated manner than the way I'm doing it right now. One moment, and I'm gonna do, You know what's funny? How long have we been living with Zoom? And I'm still struggling and it's unacceptable as far as I'm concerned. So, um, oh, and Sherry, you did join. Excellent, Sherry, welcome. Okay, and rounding out our alumni um, is Sherry Kuzowski, who is um, graduated from the MA in Climate and Society program in 2021. Thank you so much, Sherry. I really appreciate um, you joining us this evening. So. Um, and then just for fun, I'd like to see in the chat box, we have students joining us from Australia, Ohio, San Francisco Bay Area, Philly, um, wow, Durham, England, uh, Cali, Columbia, welcome. Um, I'm seeing a couple um, from San Diego. And oh, we, we got somebody from the Bronx, I love it. Um, Bogota, so welcome everybody, this is phenomenal. Um, so what I'm going to go ahead and do is to begin the panel um, 
why don't we um, go ahead and start? I'll start with maybe if we can begin with um, Elizabeth. The first question um, is, can you share with us a little bit about your undergraduate education background, kind of what you were studying prior to the MA in Climate and Society, and, and also for the alumni specifically, what are you doing today? So Elizabeth, if we can start with you, that'd be great. Sure. First of all, I'll say congratulations to everyone who was admitted for the fall. That's a great accomplishment, and you should all be very proud of yourselves. Um, a bit about me. So my educational background was a little bit mixed, just like climate and society, a little interdisciplinary. So I studied physics and international affairs at Georgetown University for my undergrad, and I was based out of D.C. there. And currently my role is with the Boston Consulting Group and I am an associate in climate and sustainability there. Excellent, thanks Elizabeth. Uh, and Brianna? Yeah, I echo the sentiments that uh, Elizabeth shared. Congratulations everyone. I'm sure you will uh, greatly benefit from this program and all it has to offer. So I'm excited for y'all to begin your journey. And I, before I came to Climate and Society was uh, an undergrad. I was went to UCLA and I studied geography and environment and political science um, while I was at UCLA. So after that, I actually had a fellowship in which I worked in international policy with Friends of the Earth, um, doing some legislative work. And that led me to my current role um, now working with We Act for Environmental Justice. We're a community-based organization in Harlem, and I run our state legislative affairs. Um, so it's really great, um, fulfilling work that I get to do and excited to talk about a little more today. Thank you, Brianna. And then rounding out our alumni, Sherry, can you share with us a little bit about your background? Full disclosure, Sherry, you, didn't, you and I didn't get a chance to connect before, but are you a Floridian by chance? Are you from Florida? I'm not from Florida, but I did go to school in Florida. Oh, okay, I got very excited because I am a Floridian. I saw you went to UF, but go ahead. I'm now, I'm literally giving a preview to your background. If you want to just share <laughs> with us a little bit about your education and what you're currently doing. No, it's, uh, thank you. Sorry, everyone that I was late. Um, I had to reset my password because it had been that long since I had uh, logged <laughs> to my Columbia email. But um, so yes, I went to school in Florida, the University of Florida, and I got my degree in wildlife ecology and conservation with a minor in sustainability studies. And I work now at a school as a K through 12 educational specialist in an ecology program. Excellent. Thanks, Sherry. Um, and then um, and now moving on to our current students, Abhinav, can you share a little bit about your background prior to joining the program? Yeah, so I did my uh, engineering back in India. After that, I have one more master's in which I focused on forestry management. And then I worked for a, around two years in India in a nonprofit. That's, and then I joined Climate and Society. That's me. Excellent. And then, um, Memo, can you share with us a little bit about your background? Yes, thank you. Uh, congratulations, everyone. Uh, I hope you're very excited. Uh, my background is I did my undergraduate students uh, studies back at Mexico City. Uh, it was sustainable development engineering. And before coming to Columbia, I worked for a year and a half on policy uh, things. I worked for the British Embassy on the COP26 campaign. And I also worked with uh, GIZ for the uh, German Development Agency. And yeah, I'm so happy to be here with you all. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you for your introductions and kind and um, providing us a little more context to your education backgrounds. Um, if we could begin um, maybe with Sherry, could you tell us a little bit about, I know this is something that's very unique to the Climate and Society program. We always like to say, what's your climate story? But could you share with us a little bit about your kind of motivations for joining such a unique interdisciplinary program? Yeah, so I knew that I wanted, so I wanted to go into climate education and a program that offers inter interdisciplinary skills was really important to me. And so what I was most drawn to is 
kind of that first semester where you learn a lot of the hard sciences and then have the ability to be able to work more in the communication sphere of that in that second semester. And then how your last semester is truly an internship and going out and being able to apply the skills. And I really liked when the shortened time frame really worked well for my life plan um, and uh, working, uh, you know, kind of going through and having that through line in the pedagogy of the program uh, really benefited what I wanted to go into. And I think it's um, something really unique and wonderful about this program that because it's interdisciplinary, it attracts people from so many different um, backgrounds and studies. And so you learn almost as much from your peers as you do from the program itself. Excellent. And Elizabeth, can you um, touch on that as well, kind of what your climate story is or motivations for the program? Yeah, for sure. So from my undergrad experience, I at first thought I wanted to be a physicist. And when I found myself in a physics lab in the basement of the science building in a clean suit, I real I like looked up and I couldn't see the sun and I realized this is not what I want to do. I definitely want to be in something that's science-based, but I don't necessarily want to be in that nanomaterials lab that I was in. I want it to be kind of in the in-between of where science meets impact. And I found that climate was like the greatest calling within that. And so I initially started out in the climate sphere through um, a bit more of a physics approach, looking at remote sensing, um, satellite imagery. Um, if anyone's done NASA develop, that was one of my first um, forays into that sphere. So that was great. And then I came to climate and society because I really wanted to continue that pathway and learn how from like the sound scientific foundation, how you can expand on that to make the biggest broad stroke impacts on society that can leave behind the most positive difference for the most people. Thank you. And then just because I'm on an alumni theme, clearly, Brianna, could you share with us a little bit more about um, kind of your climate story and, and why this interdisciplinary program um, spoke to you, so to speak? Definitely. I first got into climate and climate activism and advocacy when I was in high school, really. Um, I was creating a community garden um, and then I kind of it gave me the opportunity to kind of look around and realize um, that my community was an environmental justice community. Um, the school I went to high school um, at in South Central Los Angeles was directly under one of the busiest freeways in Los Angeles. Um, there were air quality issues, there were heat issues, um, a lot of pollution for, for the kids living and as a result, asthma conditions for a lot of the populations of students. Um, and so I wanted to learn more about cities and how they work and who builds them. And I went to UCLA to study geography so I could learn that. Um, and then uh, that took me into policy and ways I can make change for um, cities like mine and folks who lived in those districts. Um, and that drove me to learn more about policy. And I knew if I came to Columbia, then I could learn from some of the brightest minds and um, be mentored by some of the greatest people working in the climate sphere, which was very much the case. And I benefited greatly from professors like Michael Gerard, who are um, still my mentor, who is still my mentor to this day. And um, also Kate Marble was fantastic um, to learn from. And I really benefited from folks like Anel Hernandez, who taught environmental justice in New York City. Um, and uh, last class, but not least, was for, with Donna Gibbons Davidson, um, who also taught about um, a case study about environmental racism in Detroit and ways that those policies are persisted and, and the ways they develop in the first place. So I learned so much from everyone that I um, had the privilege of taking a class with. And those folks are still in my life today in some way. And I'm so grateful for the community I've built. Thank you, Brianna. And I really appreciate that um, really detailed explanation in terms of the touchstones of the, the courses that you took as it relates also to environmental justice. A lot of our admitted students are deeply committed to that and, and definitely want to better understand how this program in Columbia University can touch on that. So I really appreciate that. It might be coming up further in Q&A. Um, 
Uh, how about Abhinav? You know, you have a classic STEM undergraduate degree. I love it. Our program has seen a great evolution. We have students with these social science backgrounds and um, natural science backgrounds with your engineering degree. Can you tell us a little bit more about your kind of climate story and, and what led you to climate and society? Uh, so I did my, my engineering was in metallurgical and materials engineering. I worked in a steel industry, steel, steel plant back in India, which I didn't like much because of the emissions and the heat over there. That's that's when I realized that's what not that's not what I want to continue. And I was always inclined towards the social aspects of the so, like how to develop the society kind of thing. And climate change is the biggest threat of the current century. So that's when I decided I want to learn more about climate change, the dynamics of climate change, why climate change is happening. And one of the biggest advantage of climate and society program is that it gives you the perspective of physical part of it, physical aspects, atmospheric science of it. So that's why I joined climate and society. It gives you the chance to learn more about the physical aspects as well as the through the electives, you can learn more about the things that you are interested in. So that's one of the good thing about Climate and Society. That's why I joined CNS. Thanks, Abhinav. And then last but certainly not least, uh, Memo, could you share with us a little bit more about kind of your climate story and, and what led you to this interdisciplinary program? Sure. Uh, so back when I was in college in Mexico City, I started uh, my first uh, major was industrial engineering. Uh, but then I realized that I wasn't very excited about the like job options or like the future. And I remember talking with some people from the sustainable development department. And regardless of being uh, challenging because of all the climate anxiety, I could tell that all of them were so committed to this like this cause and they were actually really happy and everyone was doing something from a very different perspective. So uh, I decided to switch to sustainable development engineering. Uh, my background was very engineer focused. I worked a lot on renewables, but then uh, I started to work with the, from the policy perspective with the British embassy. And uh, I found it really interesting. Uh, all the climate commitments, all the international action, uh, all the funding, um, all the politics that behind climate action. And when I was looking for master's programs, I thought that Columbia's uh, curriculum was really interesting because uh, it gives you opportunity to tailor uh, half of the program based on your interests. Uh, so the first semester is so insightful because it gives you uh, a lot of information on the scientific uh, background of the climate change uh, crisis. But the second semester, you can tailor it depending on what do you want to pursue. Uh, maybe something more investment, more engineer, more law, uh, more activist. So uh, I thought that was really, really interesting. And that's what ultimately made me choose this program. I love that response. And now that brings me literally to my next question, because so often when I'm corresponding um, or meeting with prospective students and certainly Nick Klaus, who I should give a shout out to, Nick Klaus Smith is, works with us in the admissions office. And Nick Klaus also is a current member of the cohort this year and monitoring our Q&A um, and, and does a phenomenal job. I'm sure many of you guys have already connected with Nick Klaus. But one thing that comes up so often is students asking about the cross-registration journey. They really wanna understand the electives with which students pursue. And something I try to convey is like, no student is the same. You might be sitting there in the same dynamics course, but your elective journey is gonna look vastly different than the person sitting next to you. So, and Memo, you kind of gave a nice preview. If you could like expand on what electives you decided to pursue, um, be, feel free to be authentic. What challenges might you might encounter as a comes to the cross-registration journey. Um, and then certainly for Abhinav and Memo, if you if you did take any 
um, the climate school itself now has introduced and launched quite a few electives. In fact, this year we have 12 electives um, that um, two years ago, for example, during Sherry's tenure did not exist. And I think there was only three during Elizabeth and, and Brianna's time in the program. So, um, it, you know, if you did take any cross registering any climate school electives, that would be wonderful, but not to put you on the spot if you didn't, but um, in terms of, could you share with us kind of your cross registration journey so far? What have you been taking? Sure. Uh, this semester I'm actually taking from, uh, three elective options I have. I'm taking two from the climate school. Uh, one is climate communications and the other one is disaster management, climate change and disaster management. Uh, I find both of them really, really interesting. Uh, the professors are have such interesting and diverse backgrounds. And what I find really useful is that they are constantly bringing guest speakers from those specific fields of climate. Uh, where they can answer more specific questions on what they are doing, uh, what led them to be where they are, and also to share some of these same questions we're answering now, like what was their climate uh, history uh, behind their professional development. And um, I think the cross registration was really exciting, uh, but uh, Abhinav and Nick uh, can agree that it can be, uh, overwhelming in a very positive way because we have so many options, so, so many options. Uh, so you have to prioritize uh, depending on many things. Do you want to have many classes? Do you want to use something that it's going to serve as an input for your professional development? Do you want to take a class that you'll never have the chance to take ever again? Uh, so uh, I guess my criteria was I want to take classes that I want to learn something that I'm not uh, really a, an expert. Uh, so uh, that's why I chose uh, disaster management. I'm actually taking one elective with Nick that's not about not from the climate school, uh, but it's energy efficiency in buildings, and that's quite related to the climate targets. So uh, even though it's not from the climate school, I find that one very interesting. But my favorite elective so far was uh, from the last semester and it was uh, climate stakeholder management. Uh, it was very discussion based. Uh, every two weeks we had different case of studies where we had uh, to uh, analyze different conflicts that have climate and environment on its center and how the different stakeholders had like their perspective and with the like main point of always validating that perspective, even though you not agree with that. So I thought that was uh, really interesting. Uh, and that's my journey on that. That's great. No, that's wonderful. And, you know, I, I, I'd love to now, if we could pivot to, I'd love to hear Brianna share a little bit more about her elective journey, because it sounded quite robust, especially in the environmental justice realm. Um, could you share with us a little bit authentically about your experiences with cross-registration? How did that go? Is there any things that, that our in, um, admitted students should be aware of in, in terms of that? And then are there any courses that really resonated with you? Yeah, thank you. I took three courses that really stood out to me um, outside of the climate school as part of my electives. Um, they were, it was the, actually four. Um, so one of them was environmental law. I took that with SUMA. Um, and that was really helpful in setting the foundation for a lot of um, federal policies and state, even New York state level policies that I um, provided a lot of background information for things I use often today. Um, and there was the climate law class with um, Michael Gerard, which also provided me with a strong foundation We might have lost Brianna for the moment. Um, so while we, uh, I'm sure she'll be coming back, but while we, uh, while we wait maybe for the more internet stability there, um, maybe could we talk, um, touch on Elizabeth, if you could share with us a little bit your, your elective journey. Yeah, for sure. So for my electives, I really wanted to focus on getting the most robust science education that I could. So I took additional climate modeling courses which I'm not too sure if they were the most popular, but I 
that was really great. I really wanted to leave the program feeling like I could take any climate data set and work with it. And I can say that I do feel that way now. So I took an additional climate modeling course. I took um, a course modeling sea level rise. And I took a really interesting course. Most of these were in the sustainability science program. That was pretty easy to cross register for. I know some of the other schools, such as the law school and the business school, are a little more difficult to cross register for, depending on um, space limitations and so forth. But um, the last class that I really enjoyed was on air quality. So it was air quality and human health. So we were actually given air quality monitors that we walked around and and monitored the different air quality in like the subway and the grocery store. I took it on runs with me. And then we did like this big analysis at the end where we, like my project was, we looked at what different um, links we could tie between COVID mortality and air quality in New York City. So really like hands-on projects in those science classes that were really great. Thanks, Elizabeth. And yeah, it, um, forgive me. Yeah, I, when we say SUMA or SUSI, sometimes at Columbia, we love an acronym. We're referring to sustainability management and sustainability science, which are close partner programs with us. And we do have quite a few students cross-register in those programs for electives as well, um, certainly. So um, thank you for that. And so sorry, it looks like Brianna came back, which is phenomenal. I was like, we lost Brianna. <laughs> but um, Brianna, if we could if, feel free if you wanted to kind of tie it with a bow, so to speak, your, your elective journey. I know you got interrupted. I apologize. I did. Thank you. No, that was totally my fault. My Wi-Fi gave out. Um, but yes, yeah, so I was enrolled in Michael Gerard's class, climate law, really set a strong foundation as well. Um, I believe that Memo touched upon it for everything we really need to be doing on climate to reach our um, goals across the state and across the U.S. Um, and the other two classes that were particularly environmental justice focused were um, with SIPA and SUMA. The SIPA class was with Anil Hernandez talking about environmental justice in New York City. She provided a whole host of topics like food waste and water, um, health, um, in relations to what New Yorkers are facing and um, environmental justice concerns across the city by those communities. So that also set, and also it was very solutions focused, both Anel Hernandez's classes and um, Donna Given Davidson's class provided very um, strong case studies and foundations in exactly ways the communities themselves are thinking about solutions to the climate crisis and ways that they're facing it in their community and um, what they're doing about it that could um, even be applied across the U.S. or to New York City. So um, it gave me a lot of hope being in those classes, knowing um, that there were a lot of communities out there already working to solve a lot of the issues we were always talking about. Um, and overall, it was a great course. Uh, issues I've had with cross-registration um, were that the climate school is so new that a lot of the other schools within the climate school, like SIPA, SUMA, um, they had like priority registration. So we would often be the last to register for a class, meaning a lot of it got full by the time it was open to us. So I often did struggle to get into those classes. I really knew I I wanted to benefit from and take like the ones I mentioned um, and the way I fought for them were really just going to Columbia and saying I really need to be in this class um, and having to make a case for myself in that way. So um, I hope that's not the case for you guys this year but if it is then there are ways you could get in touch with folks like the administration's office or your program director and let them know to help you um, get in the door um, for those classes. Yeah, the course shopping period, I don't know, what's the most diplomatic way, like, of me putting it, is dynamic, um, is that right? Um, that can be, that, that can be the, the case, and um, uh, so maybe if actually, um, let's see here, Sherry, could you share now maybe a little bit about which electives you, you kind of pursued while in the program? I also took NL Hernandez's uh, environmental justice course, and I really- Wow, we are like, this is, yeah, you gotta get in touch, you know, that's great. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, just a big plug for NL, uh, fantastic teacher, fantastic person. And I also took human rights in the Anthropocene, which I really enjoyed. And I think those two 
I personally uh, picked electives that I kind of thought tied into each other um, since I really wanted to look more into the impact solutions of how people are going to be affected by climate change. And But human rights in the Anthropocene is through, it's the, I don't, <laughs> I don't know the acronym, but it's like the Graduate School of Architecture and uh, Preservation and something else with yeah. that. GSAP. It's the Graduate School of Architecture Planning and Preservation, I believe. is the, So GSAPP. Yeah, th that I think was a really interesting course since I have no architecture background, but it's, you know, people, it, architecture infrastructure is going to be so integral as we're talking about climate change. And it was really interesting. Um, I ended up writing, I don't know if you all still kind of do the, uh, like you publish an article on, uh, I don't know if it's the Climate Schools website or some website that's related to a topic in um, Brian and Andrew Kay's class. And I did mine actually on a professor that came and talked in the Human Rights and the Anthropocene class. His name's Jorge Otero Palos, and he um, is preserving the pollution on buildings all around the world because it tells a story of how, you know, history has evolved. And he's like taking these huge casts. Check it out. Um, but so uh, I really enjoyed um, the Human Rights in the Anthropocene course. And then I don't think it's offered anymore, but um, Mary Heglar taught a course on climate grief and dealing with your feelings with climate change. And I think that that was a wonderful course because not only does it give you the tools to help others through the emotions. And as somebody who wanted to go into um, education at varying grade levels, I know that when we're talking about these big topics, you're gonna have big feelings, but also acknowledging that it can be difficult for people who are in the sphere. And so learning how to handle your own emotions with it as well. And Sherry, I can confirm they are still doing that. In fact, Avinav and, and Memo, maybe you can talk about the zines that you started working on. I saw a lot of creativity, Nick Klaus as well, going on last night, in fact, um, in the applications course. And the, the website that it's published on is State of the Planet, which is the blog for Columbia Climate Schools Earth Institute. If you guys haven't checked out State of the Planet yet, I really encourage you to do so. It's phenomenal. Um, so just throwing out a plug there. Um, and maybe last but not least, I believe we got everybody but Abhinav now. Um, uh, tell us a little bit now about uh, your electives. For my elective, like Elizabeth, I wanted to do more sciencey kind of stuff. So I took, I'm taking a class right now with Earth and Environmental Engineering called Environmental Data Analysis and Modeling, in which I'm learning about more like how to analyze environmental data sets using Python and R. And I'm also taking one course with another one course with Environmental Engineering Department, GIS. And I think GIS is what, one of the most important skill set that you can have working in the sector. So I will definitely recommend taking that course, GIS, if you don't have that skill set right now. And the other course that I really enjoyed was with Sustainability Management. It's uh, Environmental Economics class. And so more of a science heavy things that I want to do. That's why I took that, that those courses. And regarding cross registration, yeah, it can be overwhelming like like brianna mentioned some of the some of these schools they prefer they have priority like sepa it's very difficult to get into some of these sepa courses but it's not you should talk to the professor that you are really interested in taking his class and definitely reach out to him so it's not impossible but yeah sometimes it can be overwhelming and difficult to get in um and then i might do just one more question um, and I think uh, for uh, maybe the, the, the one question I like to give is what's one piece of advice you would share with admitted students planning to attend the program? Is there one piece of advice you would like to share with the admitted students um, who are, are planning to attend or still weighing their options, but likely attending? Um, how about we start with Brianna? Any advice for the, the students uh, planning to attend? I would really immerse yourself in the climate community that is within New York City. Um, get like network with um, your professors, but also with your peers. I think Sherry put it really well and that you're gonna learn from them as much as you do from 
um, the folks that teach the courses. And they're, um, if you're in this program, you're already amazing and you're likely gonna benefit from finding a community within this great city that are doing some pretty cool projects that you can tap into. Um, I know I had the opportunity to do some really awesome things while I was at Columbia. I started interning with WE Act for Environmental Justice and I was also um, able to work with a professor up at Lamont um, talking to folks living in Alaska and indigenous communities and their um, struggle with climate change and what they're facing on the front lines of the crisis. So um, doing research with the professors and um, learning um, that community and networking was is really a, a great way to propel your career forward in New York City. Apologies. How about Elizabeth? Any any advice you'd like to give to the admitted students? Yeah, I think Brianna put that really well. I think just piggybacking off of that, Columbia has so many opportunities you can take advantage of. And definitely you can't do everything, but you can really do anything. So pick a couple of things that you might be interested in and dive as deep as you want in there. I think that you shouldn't pass up the opportunity to do research. My research at Columbia was really great. I also worked up at Lamont. I did research on climate migration within West Africa. So really great. And then also was a TA for a GIS course. So I will second the GIS plug, very important skill. And then also just throughout the program, look for different opportunities you can to put in a couple extra hours, either in like projects that you're really interested in to just dive that one level deeper or different you know, internships or so forth that you can pursue during the program is really worth it. Excellent. Avanov, any advice? I think I, I think Elizabeth and um, Brianna covered everything, but it's important to utilize the resources as much as possible because there are a lot of things that Climate School and Columbia have to offer especially research opportunities, getting involved with the professors, the things that you are interested in, definitely reach out to professors and get involved with the research. It's definitely helpful, very helpful. Excellent. Memo? Uh, I agree with uh, all the points made. Uh, I would like to highlight what Brianna said, that uh, you are all very smart and you already admitted so try not to struggle as much distress as much for the classes but just enjoy the experience because it's just so fast uh, and just enjoy the company of your peers and learning from them and just talking with them and of course with the professors and then to round things out sherry and then as soon as sherry's done we're going to open up and address your questions directly sherry any advice um I think it kind of ties into the last point made, which is because it's a short program, I think intentionality really matters. So really thinking about what you would like, like obviously you're going to probably, you know, not only gain skills, but like possibly gain a new passion throughout going through the course. So obviously explore all of your options, but I think it is better not to overextend yourself because then you may get less out of everything than you could possibly get out of a few um, classes. But so just kind of being mindful that there is only so much time within, you know, the year. And so really uh, thinking about what you want to do, perhaps where you want to go, and then kind of tailoring your, because you really do, it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to tailor your education as much as you can within this program. So just um, being mindful of the limited time while doing it. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so now let's go ahead. I, I'd love to now take a look at some of the questions that came in. And in fact, Niklaus, um, is there any questions in the Q&A that, that you um, uh, think would be great for the panel? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, one of the ones that's standing out to me right now is um, deciding uh, whether or not to pursue a capstone or an internship option. Um, I think 
myself uh, and Abi and Memo don't necessarily have the tools to speak about this because we're undergoing that process ourselves. <laughs> right now. But um, I would love to hear from Elizabeth and Brianna and Sherry about your experience um, with trying to find an internship or uh, electing to do a capstone project if you ended up doing that. So I'll hand it over to you all now. to you. Sherry? Sure. Um, I was kind of lucky where uh, my the people that I did my GRA with um, uh, extended it and gave me the opportunity to uh, intern with them over uh, the summer. But I kind of, I don't know if this is the best example, but it's, I got to, in theory, like kind of intern with three different spheres for the summer because I got to work with um, Cassie Zhu at uh, the Earth Institute. And then I also worked with uh, Laurel Zymi, um at, at uh, Mont Doherty and then working with my people at the IRI that I did my GRA with. And it was kind of split up throughout days of the week. Um, and they were very cognizant of like that my time was spent like that. So I don't know if that necessarily, cause like it sounds like I was doing a lot more than I was, but um I really enjoyed my internship experience, especially being able to work with different organizations and different people and not only gain skills in education and outreach, but in just development of myself. Uh, no, knowing that I had just started out, I came from undergrad to graduate school. And so knowing that this is truly kind of the beginning of my career, uh, gaining tools from people who are were farther along than theirs. I think that the capstone projects are really fantastic and have a lot of benefits just for me personally. I really liked continuing the work I was doing in my uh, GRA. So that's why I went with the internship. That's great. And that's kind of an organic natural through line. That's not typical, but it's a great example, Sherry. Brianna, how about um, your experience? I think your experience was quite enriching, right? It was WEACT, correct? Yeah. I started interning with we act actually second semester of grad school um spring semester i was part-time i was remote um and they worked with me to really allow me to continue to do the work at we act and um be a full-time student um so that was a real i'm really grateful for that experience and how i even found that position was honestly through um, LinkedIn. So again, network, network. <laughs> and when that experience finished, my internship was complete and I was graduating from the climate school. I was, I just had, I was extremely grateful um, and lucky to get to easily seamlessly transition from a part-time internship to a full-time job as soon as I graduated. And full-time jobs do fulfill the requirements of the summer program. A lot of folks who come to the program um, already are full-time employees or working somewhere or full-time staff. So um, folks who had existing jobs couldn't take on another internship or a capstone. So um, full-time jobs do fulfill your summer requirement. Um, and the climate school actually um, work with us to make it so we could um, do the, the summer um, part of the program and also knew we were um, already, some of us had already started our journey in the workforce. Um, so that is an option. And honestly, it, it for me was the best option, just given the so the financial aspect of things, capstones and research and GRAs don't often pay students a livable wage living in this really expensive city in the United States. Um, so full-time job was my best option and, and one I'm really grateful I had the opportunity to pursue. So if it's one, if it sounds like it's even the best option for you, I would suggest start looking to be full-time um, even like as soon, almost when you're like the last month of the program. Um, so use Gerald. <laughs> yeah, Gerald's our career development officer. They are phenomenal. And in fact, next week's uh, accepted student event is uh, Gerald going over climate careers and detailing um, out, in fact, career outcomes in great detail from Elizabeth and Brianna's graduating class, which is really fascinating because, um, well, every year the students end up going into really diverse workspaces and sectors. 
Um, but last year in particular was really interesting. So uh, if you can make Gerald's session, which is going to be March 14th, um, I, I will also be sending out email reminders about that. Please do so. Thanks, Brianna, for giving that little preview. In fact, that was a great segue. And then Elizabeth, tell us a little bit about your um, summer. What was that like? I'll reiterate that the summer is a lot less structured than the rest of the program is. It's very much, you have the freedom to make the summer what you want it to be. I did two things. I continued on with my research in climate migration. And then I also worked for the Red Cross Red Crescent um, Climate Center in climate and conflict. I'd highly recommend there. They were really great. Um, and throughout that process, I'd also remind you that unless you already have full-time jobs, that's also when you're probably applying for jobs. So also having a little bit of room to um, fit that into your schedule as well. But I have heard a lot of positive things about capstones as well, even though I personally did not do one. It just very much depends on your project, what the um, capstone exactly will look like throughout your summer. And if you don't uh, like me as an administrator, I want to give a plug to the capstone. So forgive me for this, but I, I, I do want to note that I, there's a number of students that in fact, in Elizabeth and Brianna's cohort, a small number that actually pursued both, interestingly. They did both the capstone as well as an internship. The policy behind that would be that the capstone would then count towards your six credit hours and the internship would not. Um, but I just want to throw that out there that if there is an internship opportunity that's, that's resonating with you and really impactful, as well as the, the capstone, maybe it's an organization that you're targeting, maybe the project itself could really round out your resume, you could potentially do both. Um, and stay tuned because Gerald's right now finalizing capstone organizations for this coming uh, summer 2023. So you might be able to, in fact, hear a little bit more about what those capstones look like um, during next week's session. Um, Great. So is there any other Nick Klaus uh, questions? In the, well, there's quite a few Q&A questions. Forgive me. Um, anything else that came in that's... that's uh... Yeah, for sure. Um, I think we could also touch on now um, a little bit of academic rigor and uh, coursework load, um, kind of what everyone's experience was um, or has been uh, so far in terms of balancing uh, kind of work and uh, maintaining a, a life outside of the Columbia Climate School. Um, I think uh, that you guys definitely have some insight into that. So um, I'll hand it over to you. Anybody want to go? Sorry. <laughs> uh, I can go. Um... Uh, given that I had a, an engineering background, the like the quant classes weren't as hard for me. Uh, they uh, one of the classes has a lot of physics, especially the dynamics is a lot of physics, and quant is a lot of statistics. Uh, but they give you the resources over the semester. Uh, but given that it's fast paced, it can be challenging if you don't have a quant background. Uh, for me specifically, uh, I struggled a bit with keeping up with all the readings because uh, we have to read uh, a lot every week, uh, but it gets easier uh, each each week. That's my experience. Great. Um, I'll say as well that at the climate school, they really don't want you to fail. Like that's not the goal. They want you to succeed. So they're going to... It's gonna be fast paced and it's gonna push you, but ultimately it's it's easy to say this now, but it's not totally about the grades. It's about the process. And again, they want to just push you to learn as much as you can. There was a, a if, if I could just pivot, there was a great question. Um, one of our admitted students, Lucas asked, is aside from um, GIS, which was referenced quite a bit as an, um, an elective option, what hard skills did you learn through the core versus electives. Um, is there any hard skills that you learned in the core? Um, could I throw out there one and you guys can agree with me or not? I mean, I know you use RxL heavily. Would that be, would that, would everybody be in agreement on that? Is there any other hard skills in the core that you would highlight? I can go. So in, in uh, in the core courses, you learn memo already mentioned the quant part tells you like teaches you about the statistics. If you don't have that background, particularly statistics is very important. So they teach you statistics and are 
how to use R uh, to analyze data sets. That's what in core courses you learn the hard skills plus the physics behind the climate change. So this all things are taught in the first semester, which is very important and useful. But at the same time, if you don't have that background, you should not worry because teachers and TAs will help you out to learn things. So that's the one of the hard skills that you learn through the core courses. Also in the second semester, there is a extension of the dynamics course in the first semester called regionals, regional of climate dynamics, which is also kind of hard skill that you learn about climate change. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, another question came in, actually, I'm not sure if it's uh, that came in how, uh, we might have kind of already uh, touched on this, but a lot of students, I just want to say, are coming to this program with social science backgrounds, non-STEM backgrounds. There isn't a level of intimidation that occurs um, uh, among our, our applicants when they think about the core. Um, so one of the questions is, how tough are the core courses for someone without a programming physics or statistics background? Does anybody with a non-STEM background want to take a crack at that? Yeah, I can. I came to the program with a strong political science background, and I also did geography, which had some GIS component and remote sensing component, but nothing like physics or stats heavy um, that I study in my undergrad. So it was a large learning curve. Um, and it was really challenging, I'm not going to lie. It, it um, made a lot of folks um, question if they were the right person for the program. And I'm going to tell all of you that you are um, the right person for the program. And your peers will be there to help you. You lean on your TAs heavily. Um, they all want to, like Elizabeth said, everyone wants to see you succeed. and. Um, even your professors, I'm sure they're willing to set aside um, outside office hours to um, tutor you one on one if you're really struggling to understand a concept. Um, so I really made use of all those resources, TAs, professors, my, my peers to get through the program and I learned so much um, with in regards to hard STEM skills um, and it's really helpful for the work I do in policy today when it comes to researching and data and using um, reports that come out from different agencies like Department of Health or the IPCC um, to back up my claims I'm making to advocate for environmental justice communities across the state. Excellent. Excellent. Um, there was another question actually in here, and forgive me if it was already um, addressed, but it was specific for um, Elizabeth. I loved it. It was um, Elizabeth, uh, given your role at Boston Consulting Group, if you could go back to do it again, would you take one to two less climate modeling classes because the core equips you with enough GIS modeling skills, et cetera, and instead pick up one to two classes on sustainability um, intersections and um, consulting, management finance, anything that What's your take on that? I actually, Lucas, that's a great question. Um, not that we want to do any journey over again, but yeah, any <laughs> any insight on that? No, for sure. Thanks for the question. I'll say that I wouldn't change anything about my journey. I think that the program is designed to be interdisciplinary, and I really view my role in my job currently as kind of like the climate sounding board for everything. So whether it's you know, in some of my past projects, it's like designing regenerative agriculture loan programs for large, like billion dollar banks, or whether it's designing how different governments are going to procure 100% carbon free electricity. You know, I view my role as the, as like the voice of the climate science and making sure that every decision that we make is clear and sound on that front. So I viewed my time with taking that intense climate science as really positive and I think helps me today. And I wouldn't do it over again, but there are some big learning curves afterwards. So if you do want to go more so into an interdisciplinary um, approach to the program, that's also very valid. 
Thanks, Elizabeth. Another question came in, I think from Alora, and forgive me now, I should have had this on the top of my head immediately. I know Sherry mentioned she did pursue a GRA. I'm not sure if anybody else on the panel specifically obtained a GRA. I do want to note that they are competitive. Um, this uh, past year's cohort, there were 20 GRA positions and we had around 75 students enrolled in the program. So there were more students that were interested in GRAs than we had available. You do have to competitively apply to them. But for those of you who are um, pursuing GRAs or pursued them, could you speak about um, the process of applying, but also the balance, the workload of the GRAs? Sherry, you kind of touched on this. Um, but if anybody else has a GRA that they wanted to highlight while they were in the program. Sorry. Oh, yeah, Sherry. Well, yeah, I'm happy yeah. to talk about mine. Uh, yeah, I know. I yeah. Step on anyone's toes if they wanted to share about theirs. But yeah. um, I know there is. So GRA positions are paid and they're for a set amount of hours. And the people that I worked with, um, some of them had been previous uh, Climate Society students. And so they were very cognizant to not uh, be conscientious of my time in those hours. Um, and so it was very manageable for me with the workload, especially in that first I would say that first month was very overwhelming for me, um, especially because I it was like, you know, 20, uh, 20, like peak COVID, like we're all on Zoom and all of a sudden, like we're uh, trying to learn new material. And so I finding a GRA for my cohort, the experience is a little different because I think we had like 25 people in it. So um, it was different, but I will say something that I appreciate and I I don't want to assume that uh, they still do it, but they send out all the information about the GRAs that are available. And they send out the uh, kind of not only background on what you would be doing, but uh, the people that are involved in it. And so I think if you are interested in it, kind of taking that extra step and reaching out and saying like, what, what you know, is this going to entail? Uh, and it's also a really great opportunity. I know someone asked about networking is that even if perhaps you don't get a GRA with that person to perhaps still keep in touch and see if they have any other research opportunities available throughout the year because their needs could change. That's excellent. And in fact, um, Sherry, thank you for a reminder. I just copy and pasted GRA positions that were available from the previous two years. So you can kind of see examples of which research centers were hiring and what the position descriptions were for those um, to give you just a flavor of what that looks like. Um, another question that was asked um, that I think was interesting is um, Lucas again, you're killing it, Lucas. You're asking some great questions tonight. Um, uh, the climate school is relatively new. What are some elements of the program that are currently in flux or changing? Or what's one exciting thing currently in development behind the scenes? So I think maybe I might be the most appropriate person to answer that because I might have access to behind the scenes more so. But I will say that the program itself has been around since 2005. So it's just very important to, to emphasize that while yes, the climate school is new, um, the MA in Climate Society program certainly has a longstanding history and has actually over 500 alumni of the program um, when it was originally within the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Um, the program has certainly undergone evolutions over the years. For example, a capstone never previously existed. It was always an internship component. The capstone was launched in 2020 um, as a result of the pandemic, but we got quite a bit of positive feedback surrounding it. And now it's definitely an, uh, an element that remains within the program. Another evolution as it relates to the MA Climate and Society, and I briefly mentioned it, was that we've been adding um, Columbia Climate School electives semester over semester. It went from three to 10. Now we have 12 electives that were offered. Um, in fact, this spring semester, we offered a phenomenal travel opportunity in partnership with the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation to travel to Columbia, the country. I know I always have to say Columbia, the country. People aren't that excited when I say Columbia, working for Columbia until they understand. No, it's C-O-L-O, -O, Columbia. <laughs> so um, that was an exciting opportunity. Um, and uh, you know, we are continuing to build partnerships. So programs, travel courses of that nature will continue to be built upon. We are currently in talks with Columbia 
um, the business school and the School of International Public Affairs. Um, there's also a possibility of potentially offering a specialization in disaster risk management. These are just previews. There's nothing set in stone right now, but um, I think what's really exciting about being at a Columbia Climate School is the, the, the newness of it brings a lot of new opportunities and partnerships for us. And we're embedded within one of the most incredible uh, research universities in the country. So it brings a lot of opportunities. The other thing I just want to note is, yes, Columbia Climate School is new, but by no means should you think that um, we were just birthed out of thin air. We were birthed on, out of the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, a 70 year standing history um, where a lot of your faculty are Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory researchers. And of course, um, the preeminent Earth Institute, the largest research center here at Columbia University. So um, a lot of our foundation is with very longstanding um, uh, entities within the university. Is there any other exciting questions that any of us really saw on the panel? Um, in terms of, um, Zarin asked a question about the internship process. I will say it's if you independently search it, although Gerald is a phenomenal research in that journey, Brianna shared that it sounds like she obtained her internship and eventual full-time jobs independently through LinkedIn, which is awesome. Um, Elizabeth, um, do you mind sharing with us how you obtained your internship? Yeah, for sure. So my internship and actually my full-time job were both kind of through the climate school. My internship, um, one of the professors, um, Roop, I don't know if she, does Roop, Roop yeah. is still teaching. Roop yes. Singh, so, yeah, Roop she's Singh. a professor and alum, yeah. She's great. She um, referred me to the Red Cross. So that's where I did my internship. And that was amazing. Just through a conversation with her about my interest, she said, you know, you should really talk to this lady, Catalina, over at the Climate Center, because she does climate and conflict. And then just really naturally, we had those conversations. And then I ended up working there for three months. So that was great. And then my full-time job at BCG, um, Gerald actually sent it out to all of the um, students. And then me and one other um, student in my year ended up working at BCG as well. So both of us ended up there through the climate school. Awesome. And, you know, I'm realizing, and I want to be respectful of time of our um, of our panelists. Um, so I just wanna say, because we are now at time, huge, huge thank you to our alumni and current students for giving um, this time this evening to speak with our admitted students. Um, again, I, I can't thank you all enough. Um, I, I correspond with the admitted students now for the last few weeks. And this is one of the kind of opportunities that they're always most interested in is, is hearing from current students and specifically the alumni as well. Um, the MA in Climate and Society, um, you know, has many different opportunities. And, and what I think I really appreciate is all of you come from such varied backgrounds. And Elizabeth, Brianna, and Sherry, your outcomes are also incredibly different in terms of the work that you're doing and, and what led you to the climate school. So I just want to say huge thank you for your participation this evening. This event was recorded. Um, there there might have been some spotty sections as it relates to the recording, so I apologize if something was might have been chopped out, but um, I do want to just also emphasize that the conversation continues. Um, so for everybody that joined this evening, if you have follow-up questions, please feel free to contact myself and Klaus and Jillian. Um, we are also a resource and want to make sure that you have all the information that you need in order to make this decision. Um, and we sincerely do hope though that you do decide to join Columbia Climate School um, for the fall of 2023. So thank you everybody. Um, thank you everybody for joining and thank you so much to, to our panelists. I can't thank you enough. Thank you all. Thank you, congrats.